Here we go. The seventh launch of SpaceX's massive Starship rocket was once again a grand spectacle for those watching in southern Texas. We have the stuff. And for those taking in the broadcast from SpaceX around the world. The mission, dubbed Starship Flight 7, was in many ways a big success for SpaceX. The roughly 40-story tall rocket thundered off the pad at 4.37 p.m. Central Time on January 16 and had a nominal ascent through stage separation. During the boost back burn, 12 out of the 13 planned Raptor engines reignited during the roughly 44-second burn. But the biggest highlight happened less than seven minutes after liftoff. We are go for booster return. The 13 middle engine sprang to life once again, and for a second time, the 71-meter tall booster cruised into the mechanical chopstick arms of the launch tower named Mechazilla. This marked the second successful booster catch across the past three missions. Oh my God! But amid the celebrations for the catch, an issue with the Starship upper stage quickly became apparent. What appeared to be flames are visible at one point when looking at one of the aft flaps, and even during ascent, a piece of steel can be seen flapping out of place. Eventually, Starship exploded, with dozens of onlookers capturing video of the upper stage as its pieces streaked across the skies over the Turks and Caicos Islands. The day after the launch, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered SpaceX to perform a mishap investigation. There were no reports of public injury, and the FAA is working with SpaceX and appropriate authorities to confirm reports of public damage on Turks and Caicos, the FAA said in a statement. On Friday, the Turks and Caicos Island government issued its own lengthy statement, announcing that the UK Air Incident Investigation Branch and the TCI would take part in the investigation as well. The safety of our residents and visitors remains our highest priority, the government wrote. We appreciate the community's vigilance and cooperation as we work alongside international partners to manage this incident. In a post-launch statement on X, SpaceX founder Elon Musk said, Preliminary indication is that we had an oxygen-slash-fuel leak in the cavity above the ship engine firewall that was large enough to build pressure in excess of the vent capability. Apart from obviously double-checking for leaks, we will add fire suppression to that volume and probably increase vent area. Nothing so far suggests pushing next launch past next month. The mishap created quite a bit of debate and discussion within the online space community, so we reached out to astronomer and astrophysicist Jonathan McDowell to get his impression on what happened, the context, and what's likely to happen next. What's weird is we saw these sort of progressive failures, one engine out and then another one and the one next to it. Uh, I'm not quite sure how that tallies with Elon's discussion of a, a propellant leak inside the vehicle uh so i guess uh and, and pressure he talked about pressure building up that couldn't vent but maybe that's in the earlier stage and then then that caused a fire in an engine that then spread to other engines something like that it's it's hard to tell when we last spoke with mcdowell it was in the aftermath of the starlink 9-3 mishap that was when a liquid oxygen leak within the insulation around the Merlin vacuum engine caused excessive cooling and an unintended hard start of the engine during its second burn. Not only did this prevent SpaceX from deploying the Starlink satellites into their correct orbit, but it also prevented the upper stage from performing a deorbit burn, which would have put it on the intended disposal trajectory. While somewhat concerning, it was not a huge cause for alarm with an upper stage the size of that of a Falcon 9 rocket, However, McDowell says he worries about the impacts if something like that were to happen when a future version of Starship is on orbit. This is, you know, more massive than Skylab, right? Maybe not as dense in some places, but it's it, it would be something comparable to the Skylab reentry in 1979. The risk to the public would be would be significant. I mean, depend, you know, as usual, right? The story is well, where is it going to re-enter? Probably the Pacific, because the Pacific is most of what's out there, <laughs> right? But if you get unlucky and it re-enters over a populated area, um, you have probably at least 20 tons of material surviving re-entry uh, spread out over a region that's probably, you know, 100 miles long by five miles wide, something like that. So anyone, I mean, the good thing about space re-entries is that it's not like that all lands in one place. And so if it lands in a populated area, it's really, really, really bad. It's like, no, if one chunk lands in a city, the next chunk may land in the farm 10 miles outside the city, you know, uh, and so, so that does limit 
the uh, the casualty risk. But still, I think there's going to have to be some serious discussions about safety and reliability for starships on orbit. As the breakup happened, the FAA sent out warnings to aviators at the time in what's called a debris response area, which caused diversions of planes and the halting of flights at South Florida airports like Miami International and Fort Lauderdale slash Hollywood International. Space vehicle mishap, a debris response area has been activated. Beginning south of just Georgetown Great Exuma, extending to the southeast. During the event, the FAA activated a debris response area and briefly slowed aircraft outside of the area where space vehicle debris was falling or stopped aircraft at their departure location, the FAA said in its statement. Stand by for individual instructions. Several aircraft requested to divert due to low fuel levels while holding outside impacted areas. McDowell says it has been and will continue to be a challenge to find the right balance between commercial aviation and commercial spaceflight since the latter can impact both public safety and commerce. If you're in an airplane over the ocean, um, you might not normally uh, have a NOTAM for that area that's under the ascent part of the track. And suddenly that's a re-entry zone. Uh, and so, yeah, it does make sense that they diverted the planes. And yeah, that's an economic impact. I don't think it's a reason not to do these launches you know, that the planes are safe as long as we do have these diversion procedures in place. And so my guess is what I would like to see is a discussion of how good are these procedures? Did it work smoothly? Could it be made to work more smoothly? Right, you've got to react quickly. Starship Flight 7 marked the first time that SpaceX launched a Block 2 version of its upper stage. McDowell says, based on videos and what's known about the telemetry data, it's hard to put together a complete picture but he suspects that rather than the flight termination system triggering, Starship may have broken apart by other means. The failures of the engines were kind of on one side initially. So it must have been really hard to keep attitude. And as soon as you try and fly through the upper atmosphere sideways, you know, you're not designed to do that even with Starship, uh, uh, at least in that, you know, dynamic environment. And so that will tend to make you disintegrate. Uh, and so that's what I bet happened. I bet that they, uh, they lost engines and then at some point they lost attitude uh, and then they lost structural integrity. SpaceX didn't mention the FTS in its post-launch write-up on the Flight 7 mission. In another post-launch tweet, Musk noted that the mission did achieve some of the test objectives from Starship, including observations from the forward flaps and tile adherence on ascent. But with a breakup happening before 10 minutes had elapsed in the mission, they were unable to test the heat shield upon re-entry or deploy the Starlink simulators that were on board. They had 10 dummy Starlink version 3s on board that they were going to spit out of the PEZ dispenser. Uh, on the suborbital trajectory, that would have happened some time after uh, when the the rut actually occurred, and so we didn't get to see that. And so again, that delays Starship's readiness to start delivering satellite payloads to orbit. With hardware and flow to support the Flight 8 mission, Musk expressed confidence that they will be back at the launch pad in February. However, that will depend on the timeline of the SpaceX-led mishap investigation that the FAA will have to sign off on. 2025 is also set to be the year that SpaceX was going to begin the Starship on-orbit refueling demonstration, which will take at least 10 launches or more, depending on who you ask. It's an important test campaign that will help prove out the architecture SpaceX proposed to support both cargo and a crew version of Starship that are designed to dock with the Orion spacecraft or Gateway and then land on the moon. McDowell says the Flight 7 mishap is a setback, but it won't deter the Artemis plans. But he says it's emblematic of how early in development Starship is still at this point. This specific incident, I think it's more a warning sign that this is still very much an early development program, that it's gonna be a while before they're mature enough to really be confident of like launching multiple ones in short succession. Even before this, I had concerns that this development program is going to take longer than a lot of people seem to think. You're going to need a lot of launches before you get the maturity to be as reliable on launch as, say, Falcon 9 is now, right? I think the timescale for doing these prop transfers is is uh, 
uh, likely to stretch anyway. As for the near future, Musk suggested at one point that Flight 8 could be the first catch of a starship in a similar way that they've caught the Super Heavy booster. McDowell says they could do that, but isn't sure that's the right move. They never know what risks Elon is willing to take. Um, uh, I, if I were them, I would I would wait one more flight. I would try and replicate the Flight 7 planned uh, profile completely successfully before I move forward to a ship catch. But betting against SpaceX is not always a, <laughs> a good idea. SpaceX says it's busily going through a data review to find the root cause of the issue and implement the corrective actions needed to fly again. McDowell says in the grand scheme of the Starship program, this is not a major setback and expects them to get back to the pad relatively soon. That's needed for a program that depends on flying to learn and then flying again. Uh, this is really the first flight of the quote real ship and so there's a long, long, long way to go between what we have now and something that can take astronauts to the moon. But there's not so far to, I think they've sort of brought down the risk for at least the Earth orbital satellite launch uh, part of Starship. That seems very doable, uh, at least technically. Economically, of course, they're gonna have to solve the, the reuse of ship on a near-term flight, maybe now not flight eight, but maybe flight nine or flight 10, if they're trying to get ship back in one piece. That's the remaining huge technical risk milestone, I think, in uh, in the program is, is demonstrating that you can bring ship back in a condition where you can reuse it. Reporting for Space Flight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.